hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tong Tong. Uh, I'm one of the Communication Leadership Alumni Fellow from 2020 to 2021. Um, I currently work at SAP Concur as a digital marketing manager, and I'm so happy to have Tamina on the call today. And special thanks for uh, coming to the program, and also thank you, Tamina, for joining us tonight. And thank you for having me. I really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And um, first, uh, our session for today will be one hour. And during the first 30 minutes, we will discuss the current policies related to international students and also learn from Tamina's expertise. And we will go through a list of questions together and cover topics like how we can better position ourselves during the uncertain time, uh, some travel related questions and some specific cases we collected and summarized from our students. And also thank you for those who participate in our online survey in advance. And then we will stop the recording and feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions directly. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the conversation, feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, I will be the person who moderate and also keep uh, an eye on the chat as well. And again, thank you so much for everyone to join us live. Uh, today, we're honored to have Tamina with us online. Some of you may know her from uh, last year's session, but for many of you who may not know Tamina, uh, she is uh, practices business immigration law at Wilson Immigration Law in Seattle, Washington. She is a frequent speaker, author, and blogger, and is regularly quoted and published in various newspapers and magazines. She is the author of the book, The Startup Visa, Key to Job Growth and Economic Prosperity in America, and host of the podcast, Tamina Talks Immigration. Tamina's practice focus on business, immigration matters, a receipt of the 2019 AILA President's Commendation. Tamina serves as the Chair of Response Committee for the Washington Chapter, a committee she helped create in November 2016. And she also serves on the AILA National Media Advocacy Committee. In 2018, she founded a nonprofit, the Washington Immigrant Defense Network, which funds and facilitates legal representation in the immigration group. Courtroom. She's also co founder of Airport Lawyers, which provided critical service during the early travel bans. So, thank you, Tamina. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So nice to see so many of you, you know, late in the day. So, thank you for making time. Yeah, so uh, I think we can start from uh, learning from your insights about the current F1 OBT H1B policies. So uh, many of you noticed that uh, the previous ICD announcement, and I'm sure that, that that caused a lot of pressure and panic on many of us. So although the uh, Trump administration resents the rule on foreign students and our international student groups still have a lot of stress, pressure and uncertainty. So I'm curious to learn your insights and how do you see those ongoing changes and anything we can do to help better position ourselves during the uncertain time? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. And I'm going to give a bit of a summary of what's happened over the last three months, particularly, or four months, time is a blur. Um, in February, late February to early March, that's when, you know, there were indications that there would be a shutdown, but it hadn't quite happened until end of March. And COVID-19 has presented an opportunity for this administration that doesn't want immigrants in the country anyway. So it's become an opportunity and a vehicle for them to really get through their various anti-immigrant agenda. And so uh, in quick succession, they've had one travel ban after another after another. And you may all remember that there was a tweet by the president that says suspending immigration and we didn't know what that meant. And uh, soon thereafter, just a few days after, he suspended um, green card applications for parents, siblings, and children that are older than 21. 
and uh, some green card applications from an employment based standpoint. And the, what, what happened from that is embassies had already closed down. So really the practical effect of this was really zero because we weren't going to see these happening anytime soon anyway. But to have something in writing gives the administration the opportunity to essentially cause fear because that's the biggest thing they're going for, but also that they can extend a directive over and over again. So once that happened, you know, uh, we were sort of thinking what's next? Um, and soon thereafter, we saw the travel ban of H-1Bs and L visas. And at the time, there was a lot of fear that they would stop F-1 visas. You know, there were a lot of writings, uh, articles, advocacy, please do not ban F-1 visas. And we really didn't know what they were going to do. So when the H-1B visa ban came along, June 22nd, we were all relieved that the F1 was not affected. However, soon thereafter, as you may all know, uh, the administration started a new policy saying, well, if you are going to be going into a, an online only class in, Feb in September, you're not going to be in status. Now, the trouble with that is as soon as uh, COVID-19 began and schools started to shut down or life started to shut down, uh, ICE had created flexibilities for students, allowing them to be studying online, as you know. And so that created immediate problems about what is going to happen to international students, but it also have a has a domino effect on, on industries, not just, you know, students. Uh, and so, of course, as you may all know, there were legal challenges brought by Harvard and MIT, and then the, the policy was rescinded. And so there is sort of like immediate relief, but there's concern, confusion and anxiety about what's next, because the overall message from this administration to any immigrant is we don't really want you here. And so that has an innate, inherent sort of anxiety that comes with that rhetoric. And so you may be feeling this, but every single one of my clients have, has been feeling it too. And one of the things that we're seeing is, you know, every, every couple of weeks where we have a plan for a client, we need to go back and speak to them and say, well, unfortunately, we need to tweak this, tweak that. I don't think we can do this now. And it's, so it's been, it's been a challenge. Now, um, for students, we do still worry about what might come. And so one of the questions that you might be asking, I forget what's on the list, is that some people might be wanting to travel when the opportunity arises. Now, travel has been a big problem. You may or may not realize this, but the world has shut down anyway. Countries have closed their borders. Even if you can go from country A to country B, that plane, if it is flying at all, might be stopping at country C. But country C might not be allowing country B's people to get in. And we've seen a lot of these problems with people who are here on tourist visas. Now, if so my general advice to anybody in the US is if you are here, with a visa that is valid for sure, but even if, if, especially if it has expired, a visa stamp that you all are probably familiar with, do not leave the country. Now, there may not be a ban necessarily on F1s at the moment, or maybe there won't be one in the near future. But what is a problem, particularly if your visa stamp has expired, is that if you leave the country, you know you have to come back with a valid visa stamp. How are you going to get that? Because embassies have absolutely been closed since mid-March, depending on which country it is, and they haven't opened up yet. Some of them are giving emergency appointments to some people, but not you know, all. And a lot of people have been backlogged because their interviews were postponed. Every type of interview you can think of, tourist visa, F1 visa, business visa, H1Bs, green cards, all these visas have been postponed. So when the embassies reopen, 
they're not necessarily going to give you priority to get in for a visa stamping interview. So traveling right now is not recommended. Uh, but if you have an emergency, I would say talk to a lawyer before you leave or maybe even talk to your DSO uh, to make sure that traveling is safe for you. If you have a valid visa stamp, I don't necessarily worry so much as long as there's no other you know, ban. But if your visa stamp is expired, that's when I would be concerned about you. Um, but in general, you know, I am expecting more trouble between now and November. You know, the, not only is there COVID-19 and a pandemic to deal with, there's social unrest going on. And on top of that, we have all of these immigration challenges and they keep coming. The other thing that we expect to see very soon are two things. Number one, USCIS is claiming they don't have enough money. And so therefore they're going to furlough 73% of their staff. However, yesterday uh, they said, well, you know what, we actually have a surplus money. We don't necessarily have a deficit, but we're still going to furlough 73% of our staff because we may run out of money in December. And so now there is a sort of um, uh, uh, some lawmakers are questioning whether they should be furloughing, but it's quite likely they can. And if they do, what does that mean for you? What it will mean for you particularly is that, you know, you're lucky that your DSOs are dealing with your I-20s and they're updating the service system. But many of you might be applying for e employment authorization documents. If that happens, we don't know if they're going to accept them because what can they do with 27% of their staff? Is that, is that math right? I'm not good at math, I think it's 27. Uh, but what are they gonna do? You know, are they going to put them in the mailing room? And you know, are they going to be accepting cases? That's my biggest concern. I want at least my cases to be accepted, but we don't know if that's gonna happen. So furlough is actually going to have a big impact. Now, let's say you have an employment authorization uh, application pending. If there is a furlough, then you will likely see that there is going to be a very long waiting time. Those of you who may have had employment authorization cards will probably know that you have to do biometrics appointments. That's the fingerprinting and the photo that they, you go to the USCIS office and they, and they put that on your card. Those have stopped completely since March. Now there's already a backlog of people who need to do that. And we really don't know when those USCIS offices will open. At least the service centers are you know, trickling and working along, but the local offices, we don't know. So there's a lot of unknowns that are going on with that. Now, the second thing that is on the horizon is that USCIS is likely to increase fees, fees very soon. Now, USCIS can't just go up and say, hey, I'm going to increase the filing fees. And just so you know, USCIS is a, an agency that relies on the filing fees. That's how they pay their employees. That's how they run the agency. And that's how, what helps you get an adjudication. But in recent history, they've been sending ridiculous requests for evidence. They're wasting a lot of time asking questions that they shouldn't be. And staff time is being used up unnecessarily. So if they have a surplus, it's because they're not being managed properly. Um, but it has given them a, a reason to say, we need to increase this now. You, so you can't just increase. You've got to go through a process. A uh, rulemaking process requires you to send a proposed uh, document through the ro uh, federal register. People get a chance to actually um, uh, recommend public comments, and they have to read all those comments, and then the government has to take them back and then make a final rule. Now, we didn't really know when that was going to happen. We thought it might happen in the fall, but because they're, they're basically claiming we don't have money, they're trying to really push it through. And it's possible that it will go through very, very soon. It could be as soon as next week. One of the clearing houses that they have to go through happened today which means it really is an imminent. And that means all filing fees, including EAD fees will go up. And on our blog, uh, which is www.watsonimmigrationlaw.com, we have a blog post with just the fee increases so you can go and see what they are.
So there are a number of changes that are coming and uh, some changes we just can't necessarily um, predict, but we know more is coming. So you need to be aware. You need to keep your eye on the news. You need to be in close communication with your DSOs and wherever you get your news. I would suggest that it's not a bad idea to sign up to our blog. You know, if it's not relevant to you, you just delete it. But we write about things that are important to our clients. Uh, a lot of the business visas that you would likely be interested in, but general immigration issues too. So sign up so you can get them. Um, uh, we also have a newsletter. I'll make sure that you know the link is sent to Tong Tong. So I, I think that's the ge ge generic view. I hope I haven't taken too much time, but I think it's important for you to have a, an understanding of where things stand. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. I think you provide us a clear timeline what things happened during the past few months. And you also mentioned there's challenges happen maybe in the next step. So regarding all the challenging, so I'm curious for some of our international students, they will graduate in December. They have like four more months to go. So during the four months from now to December before they graduate, are there anything they do besides finding a job? So are there anything they can prepare in advance and like apply the OPT uh, early than before? A uh, very good question. If you're graduating in December, uh, uh, I forget how far in advance you can apply for the OPT, but what is very important that you speak to your DSO so the OPT applications can at least be prepared so that the day the window opens, you're not wasting time preparing. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's quite common in our office. Sometimes, you know, somebody's visa is going to expire and we're sort of looking down the road thinking it's going to take six months to approve because premium processing doesn't exist. You've got to look at the calendar and you've got to walk backwards. And so I would urge you to speak to your DSO and say, hey, what do I need to do this? Give me your checklist right now and you diligently prepare the things that you need to do. Uh, um, what is going to be important is that the fee increase can go up anytime. And that you have no control over that, you know, it is what it is and you'll just have to fork that out. Um, but for the 12 month OPT, you don't necessarily have to have an employer already ready at hand. But with the STEM OPT, I believe you do. And so it depends on where you are in all of this, you know, um, stages. But it, my guess is most of you might be looking at the 12 month OPT if you're graduating. And if that's the case, very much uh, keep in contact with your DSO and maybe have a group meeting like this so your DSO can talk to you as a group. It's efficient and she, he or she can give you the information that you need. Now, jobs. Um, it's a difficult time in this country. You know, there are 44 million um, Americans without jobs. And one of the things that's important for you to know is that you are inherently skilled workers. Uh, you have talent and you have skills that employers are often looking for. And so you do have an edge over people. And you've got to basically make sure that you utilize this time to find the jobs that are appropriate for you. And what is important for you to know is that when, let's say you do get apply for the OPT, uh, you may not get it for some time because of the backlog, everything I just talked about. I, I simply cannot predict how long any application will take post COVID-19. Things that used to take four months and are, were already taking eight months. And we just don't know what the ramification will be for the back end, particularly if there's a furlough, particularly if the, if the pandemic continues, which it likely will. So you've got to plan those and you've got to sit down with the DSO and you've got to sort of look at the clock between January onwards. You know, if the application is filed, let's say, you know, September or October, what happens? And I think if you have that application pending, you can stay here, you know, while it's pending. But, you know, how long are you going to be doing that? 
you know, and there's, uh, you know, is your employer going to be waiting for you? And so you've got to do a lot of negotiations with your employer if you have one. But one thing that's going to be very important for you to know is it's a good time to negotiate H-1Bs as well. Because before you know it, let's say you are going to have an OPT from January. It will expire January 2021. What happens, oh, sorry, 2022. So what happens then? And so for some of you, and let's say somebody has an OPT already, what's going to happen to them when their OPT expires? So you want to negotiate the H-1B visa at the outset so that in um, you know, this year was a big change in H-1Bs. We, it used to be that you file it April 1 with a big petition and you wait for the lottery. This year they had a complete change where between March um, 1 and March 20th, between that tw those 20 days, employers had to submit a simple sheet saying, I want to sponsor this person and it was $10 only. Um, and so a lot of employers did that and some people got selected, some didn't. And if you're not selected, then you can plan, you know, April onwards. But if you are selected and let's say your, your um, OPT is expiring between April and September, you can ask for cap gap. You know, but if you do not have cap gap, um, you, you, you know, you have to stop, you have to stop working when your EAD comes, you know, to an end. But one of the things that's going to be important is you want to apply for an H-1B next year because you may not have the chance next year, the following year. You've got to secure the following year right this moment. So while you're looking for a job for EADs uh, under the OPT system, you've got to also see if you can in tandem talk about the H-1B. Got it, got it. Yeah, a lot of useful information. And a few follow-up questions. So to clarify, so complete program two uh, majors all count as STEM major, and we will have 12 months uh, OPT, and then we will have a another OPT extension. So does that mean for when we apply for the in OPT, the 12 months, we don't need to have an employer. We can just apply. And then for OPT extension, we need to have an employer and then mm -hmm. we can apply for extension. Yeah, so for the STEM OPT, it was, I think, two years ago. Time is a blur. So much has happened. But, you know, this administration, uh, there was a case on OPT issues, saying OPT people are taking our jobs away. And uh, I think it was the Obama administration. It used to be STEM OPTs were 17 months. And what they, what they did was the, the regulations created them so they were prolonged to 24 months. Mm -hmm. But they gave with one hand and took many things away. And one of them was that you must have an employer. The employer must be E-verified, meaning they must be using E-verify. And they must pay you a salary that is commensurate with that particular job in that particular industry at that level. So in some cases, employers would use free help. They wouldn't pay you. But in the STEM OPT, you have to get paid. In addition, the rules then um, introduced a form. I forget the number, 963-693, uh, a form that your DSO will help create, you know, complete. And the, t the school has to um, the, communicate with the employer to say this is what they're learning. It has to have a learning component. Um, and so you do need to have all of those met. Now, one of the things that we have found with our employers where we're trying to do an H-1B, so you completed the 12 month, you're going into the STEM OPT, we've already applied for the H-1B, but we haven't won the, the lottery. With the STEM OPT, the employers are not always wanting to, um, do e-verify. E-verify is a bit of a headache for employers because it's saying that we are checking everything with the compliance tools that are necessary for every employee and they don't necessarily always want to have that headache just for one particular intern. 
And so we have found, particularly in recent history, that some employers have backed out of the STEM issue leaving the student in a, in a sort of a lurch, thinking, what am I going to do next? And so those are some of the things to watch out for, that when you're talking to the employer about an H-1B, you might want to learn if they are e-verified or not. And one of the things that happens is 12 months seems like a long time from this end, but it becomes 12 months at the back end so quickly that if you haven't prepared and got your ducks in a row, you're going to find yourself in a difficult situation. Got it. Got it. Yeah, and also you mentioned the, like this year uh, between March 1st and March 20th, uh, employer can submit uh, a sheet to support uh, uh, international student H1B visa application. So I'm curious, what do you think is a good time that we should start the conversation with the employer, ask about H-1B sponsorship? And are there any other resources you can share for us to introduce the visa to the employer may didn't have any pre-knowledge about that? Yes. Um, so number one, I would start the conversation as early as possible. One of the, the, the application is always the employer's application. Mm -hmm. And so they have to basically sign their life away that we are going to comply. And the, the OPT salary, let's say you're an intern, so they're paying you an intern salary. Suddenly they have to up the salary because H-1Bs require a minimum salary for a particular job in a particular location. Mm -hmm. So let's say you are working in New York City at an entry level job and you're a doctor, your entry level salary might be $120,000. Mm -hmm. Whereas as, a, as an OPT person, you might be getting $80,000. Mm -hmm. Where, so, and that's a big jump for an employer. For in, let's say, Kansas City, in the middle of nowhere, that starting salary might be $90,000. Do you see what I'm saying? So there is a very big um, jump sometimes in the salary that makes the employer think twice. Um, the second thing is there are costs involved in an H-1B. Even if you want to pay the employer, they're not supposed to take your money. They're supposed to pay for the attorney fees, which can be anywhere between $3,000 and $6,000, depending on the law firm. Um, the, uh, and then if there is a request for evidence, there is more money to pay for that. But the government fee currently, uh, there are three components, 460 plus 500 plus 750 or 1500, depending on if you have more or less than 25 employees. And the, all, all of those costs have to come from the employer. So there is a financial burden that is attached to this. And so your job is to prove yourself worthy of you know, being part of their team. Um, and so the other thing that happens is there is this analysis that has to happen before they even submit the sheet to the lottery. And what we found actually this year, a lot of people did it on their own because they thought, ah, it's just one sheet. I'm just going to do it, but they don't necessarily realize there is a lot of analysis that goes in before we even know, are you in the master's cap or the bachelor's cap? Just because you have a master's degree in the US doesn't necessarily mean you'll be in the master's cap. You have to come from a school that is um, accredited. So we have to then go and look at the university to see if you are indeed accredited. Because if you are not, then we cannot put you in the master's cap. Um, some people have sort of mistakenly thought, well, you know, I did, you know, this PhD sort of work uh, and therefore I am to be in the master's degree cap. That doesn't fall into the master's degree cap. There's also a salary um, analysis that happens. What is your location? What is the responsibility? Are you entry level? Are you um, doing a little bit more than entry level? Are you supervising people? All of these will add different levels of salaries. And one of the things that Trump did as soon as he came into office, and you may or may not remember this, there was an executive order in April 2017 that said it was called Buy American, Hire American. And it was very simple. They said, um, the answer is yes for the UW graduate programs. UW is an accredited school. Um, but the, the Buy, Buy American, Hire American said, uh, you have to hire the brightest people and the highest paid. 
And initially I thought, well, you've got to have these in regulations. You can't implement this. But soon we saw that the government was questioning the salaries through um, all of their RFEs. RFEs are requests for further evidence. And, you know, they would say, do you really, is this really a level one, you know, salary? Show me the job description. And so that really made everybody tighten up this analysis that was necessary to do. And so there's a lot that goes into it. Um, and all of this work, you know, you really should start talking to the employer September, October, uh, and the working on it December-ish, if not sooner. Now, what do you want to tell the employer? What does an H-1B entail? So for any work visa, I want you to think about three headings. I don't know if you can see my fingers. <laughs> um, uh, three headings, the employer, the employment, and the employee. The employer means that the government wants to see, are you a real employer doing boring employer stuff? Do you have an office? Do you have an organizational chart to show all of your staff? Do you have a license to do that business? And do you have, um, do you pay taxes? Do you pay taxes to the government? Do you do payroll taxes? These are some of the common documents that we need. We need an office lease. Do you actually have a space where your people are gonna be working? Show me the um, layout of the, the floor plan. We wanna know how much square footage for your people. So that's the employer. For the employment, any work visa, not just an H-1B, any work visa starts with the employment. What we say to the employer is, please write down the job description so we can see what the code is. Because every mm -hmm. job description, uh, the Department of Labor has a code attached. They have every job out there and they have a code attached to it. And that code tells us what the salary is. That code will mm -hmm. also tell us, do you need a degree to do this job or not? Now, if the Department of Labor says, you don't really need to do, have a degree, then that H-1B is not a viable H-1B. So for example, in recent history, marketing mm -hmm. positions have come, come under challenges. And the reason for that is there are a lot of people who do self um, teaching on various software programs, Google Analytics. Uh, computer programmer is a good example. Computer programmers these days can learn software, you know, through various open software programs and your computer doing a computer program. You don't always need a degree to do that. So the government downgraded that to say, well, you don't need a degree and therefore you can't have an H-1B. The starting point of an H-1B is you must have a bachelor's degree that is the equivalent of a bachelor's degree of a US bachelor's degree. So a lot of people who come from different countries might have a bachelor's degree in whatever subject matter and then come to the US to do a master's. The starting point is really that bachelor's degree from that other country that needs to be evaluated. And that's what we need to know as the starting point. Uh, so that's the employment. Then the employee, do you match the description and the background necessary for this particular job? So me as a lawyer, if I try to get an H-1B as a doctor, I'm gonna be rejected because there's no nexus to the job and the, the, the background of the person. And so you can, if you can remember three headings, you can give this sort of summary to the employer saying this is what they want to know. And one of the things that you should know is employers don't necessarily want to share their finances with their employees, but finances are part of a, a compulsory requirement for the government to know because they want to know that you have enough money to pay. Now, one of the things that comes up for um, students or some businesses, actually, let's call it um, a vendor that does IT consulting. But this type of model works in different type of businesses where they have an employee, but they're sending them to Microsoft um, campus. That's called third party uh, work sites. And so for that, you often need to have uh, an itinerary and you, you need a lot of documentation. And I won't go into all of that, but part of it is, do you have the money? 
And the government started to ask these questions. Do you have enough work for this person? Is it your employee? But they changed those questions around to people who are not going to different offices to say, do you have enough work for this person? So then we have to show contracts with their clients and their revenue stream. So when you're trying to explain it, you want to rely on those three headings and break it down to them. So they're not necessarily surprised. But what you can say is say, well, you, look, you don't have to share your finances with me. You need to share it with the lawyer so that the lawyer can share it with USCIS. And it, all of that will be confidential. But that, those are some of the roadblocks that come up um, frequently. Got it, got it. Yes, yeah, super us. And uh, also a follow-up question. Um, many companies, they may also have their uh, attorneys or like legal team, but for some uh, company, they may not have a team to support the employees. So for many of us, if we want to reach out to an uh, immigration attorney, prep for the OP or H-1B visa or other visa types, are there any homework or research we can do on our end? Absolutely. Um, you know, there, there is a website called American Immigration Lawyers Association, AILA, -A -A they have a, a search engine for lawyers. You can put your zip code down. I'm, I'm assuming all of you are here in, um, in Seattle, but just in case anybody's listening to this that are not in this location, you can go to that website and put your zip code in and you know, do search terms, excuse me, and you will have a list of lawyers come up. And then you can search those uh, from that to see if they can help you. Um, you know, we start talking to people for H-1B starting around September, believe it or not. You know, and you're right, a lot of businesses, particularly big ones, will have internal in-house legal teams or law firms that they work with very closely, but a lot of them don't. And what we find is we start the conversation with the employee, the employee brings the employer in, and then we get moving and get them started. And that's how often we get hired. But, but you have options, and it depends on what your situation is going to turn out to be. Um, there is a question on an H-4, and I'm going to answer it because we might run out of time. Um, H-4s have been one of the casualties of all of these changes. It used to be that when your H-1B is being filed, you can currently file for the change of status for the spouse. And there is something called premium processing where you um, file for the H-1B and it will be adjudicated very quickly, within two, to, two weeks, 15 days, and you pay extra money for it. And it used to be that the spouse's application also be filed very, you know, processed very quickly. But the government instituted biometrics appointments for spouses. And what that meant is, even if you file at the same time and the H-1B gets approved, the H-1B now is, uh, H-4 is now gonna take a lot longer. And we are finding that H-4s are taking a lot longer because they have not been able to do biometrics because of COVID. And there is already a prolonged time at the moment. And so you've got to plan these out um, so that you can understand what's going to happen to your spouse, your children, and so forth. Um, but lots of changes. I do highly recommend that you sign up to our blog, watsonimmigrationlaw.com, and there's a tab called blog. Sign up to it because all these changes we're writing about, and it's going to be, you know, things that you need to know about. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for covering that question. Uh, and also, since many of international students, they may are not able to come here, they will study remotely in fall quarter. So do you see any potential impact to their future CPT, OPT, or H-1B benefits? Uh, and when you say remotely, you mean within the U.S., they're not just going to, they're not going to go to school? Yeah, That's or right. they may just stay in their home country because it's hard to get an F-1 visa right now. And so one of the things that I find is if you're not in the United States, they don't necessarily care about your visa status. Mm -hmm. The question is, can you come back in? 
And so for that, you're going to need the I-20 evaluator. These are stamped, all the things that I talked about earlier. But when you're not in this country, they don't care. And so a lot of my clients, and you know, I just, um, you might find this interesting, actually, um, particularly if anybody's listening to this and they're not in the United States, um, or anybody that's not a student or they're just American, uh, American workers. I want you to go to a, the podcast. It's called Tamina Talks Immigration. Tamina Talks Immigration, and it is, and I'll type it just so you know, it's um, on iTunes, it's on Spotify, and I just did a podcast with somebody called Abhay Mishra, and he is a co-founder of an, a company called Calm.Work, K-A-K-A-A-M.Work, I believe, but check out the podcast. And he's a, helping people get remotely connected for jobs. You know, the, you, these days, you know, COVID-19 has exposed the fact that you don't necessarily have to be at the office all the time. It was a requirement, but it turns out, turns out you don't need to. And so when people are thinking that, they think, well, I could be in, in on a beach somewhere and work for Microsoft or whatever. And so calm.com is really like a matchmaker for remote work, for where, where, you know, wherever you are in the world. And so it might be of interest to people who are not in the US or people who have authorization. You still have to have authorization to work if you're in the US. And so don't get me wrong on that part, but that, that might be a resource for people. But that was a really good question, Tong Tong. Thank you. Thank you for covering that question. And another specific question uh, regarding the H-1B. So for some of the graduate students, they join, participate this year's lottery, H-1B lottery. So what will happen if a student received the receipt notice of the H-1B lottery result, but the student's OPT-80 card was expired before the official approval of H-1B? Uh, Very September. good question. Yeah. Very good question. So it depends on when it expired. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it did not expire before April 1. Mm -hmm. the, the key is that April 1 is when you can file the H-1B mm -hmm. and you have to file change of status to get, you know, change of status means your F1 seamlessly becomes H1B without leaving the country. Now I want to talk just a little bit about that. Uh, you have the option, especially if you're on a STEM OPT, to be on an F1 for three years because your H1B is going to be for a total of six years. So sometimes it's strategic to be on the F1 for as long as you can and activate the H1B later on. But the way you activate that is to go to the embassy, get the visa stamp and enter the US on the H1B. There are challenges with it at the moment. If so, the, the current travel ban on H-1Bs means if you are not on the valid H-1B visa or not in the US, actually the administration has flip-flopped on their guidance. But if you didn't have a, um, a visa in the US uh, on an H-1B, you may, not, you may be subject to the ban in the future. We just don't know when that's gonna, you know, um, come off, you know, be be lifted. And the, the administration has put it on um, until December, but we don't know who's going to win the election. Much of it is going to depend on that. Um, so, you know, normally we would often say to the student, you know, it's up to you. We don't necessarily care whether you're doing consular processing or change of status. But right this moment in history, it makes sense to do change of status so that you can lock that in. But coming back to your question, if your OPT expired um, eight, before April 1, you're not necessarily gonna have the benefit of cap gap. Um, so cap gap is your, H1, your OPT expires after April 1, but before September 1st, you file the H1B, you take the receipt to your school and the DSO person will make an update to the service system saying that this person has applied for H1B and that automatically allows you to have that cap gap. One of the things that's gonna be important because it comes up quite often um, is um, the service doesn't necessarily say consular processing or change of status. And so 
we just were working on a case where the person did this thing where they were on the stem they said i don't want to do change of status i'm going to go to the embassy and we got a question from the government this is five years later or something saying hey you change your status and we're not going to give you extra time so we had to go back and look at their paperwork and say, no, this approval notice said consular processing. These are the stamps in her passport to show she left the country, got the visa stamp and came back. We have to prove with every single little piece of paper for the little links to show, prove to the government she didn't have change of status. So it's something to be mindful of because I don't, I don't have training in the service system. And I don't know what gets indicated in it. So it might be useful to have this type of conversation with your DSO so that you can be aware of it. The other example I will give is um, there are human errors that happen in the service update. And so recently I had a client where we did the F2 change of status for somebody. There were a spouse of an F1, we did the F2 change of status and everything was fine. Suddenly I get a call from ICE one day saying, hey, we're looking for that client. And I'm thinking, why? This person is fine. And so um, I didn't respond to the ICE officer. I called my client and said, what is going on? Why are they looking for you? Call your school immediately. Turns out the school did not check a box. And it immediately talked to ICE saying this person is not in status and they were ready to deport her. So human error can have a big impact and you've got to sort of keep in close communication with your GSO to understand these little things. Yeah, yeah. And I also expert, like have similar experience, but not a huge human error. When you got your I-20 or every documentation, just make sure double check yourself. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. 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 Very much. So. Uh, and also another question related to, you mentioned the important to have the valid EAD card, like OPT status, but how about F1 visa? So do the students need to have a valid uh, F1 visa in order to be eligible for OPT extension or H1B benefits? Um, you know, that's the thing that the administration wants to change. Part, there was a different policy, um, time is a blur, I think it was late last year, earlier this year, where the government said, one of the things, if each of you look at your passports and there's something called an I-94, if you're not familiar with it, you must be, you go to the cbp.gov, cbp.gov, and you will look for the I-94. And that tells you what kind of visa you have to be in the US, when you arrived and when you must leave. And for students, the when you must leave portion always says D slash S, duration of stay. That means that for as long as you're studying, you're completely okay to be here. So that determines your status. The visa stamp, on the other hand, that you would have gotten by going to the embassy and they put a little sticky thing in your passport, that has an expiration date. But that allows you to enter the US, you entered when it was valid, even if that expires, you're allowed to still be here. That is the current law. Your I-20 has to be valid all the time. So when we are preparing H-1Bs, we want to see every single I-20 to make sure that the, every step that you've taken in the last six, seven, eight years, there was an I-20 that was valid for that period. Because we have seen the government ask for questions. They will say, show me all the I-20s. Um, you know, there was a time where I would only send the current one. But because we started to get so many questions, it wasn't worth waiting for a question from the government, it just made sense to give them all at the, at the beginning. And so the, the Trump administration is really trying to change the duration of stay part of it, because they don't want students to be here forever. And they are saying, if you stop studying, if you, um, you know, stopped working, uh, you're, and that's the policy that was, you know, um, enjoined, meaning the court said, you've got to stop it. Um, but they are going to try to do something with that. So again, keep an eye on the news because this is a volatile 
area. Um, I was going to say something else on that, but I forgot. But that that's the main gist of that. Yeah, no worries. No worries. So uh, we have seven more minutes, and I'll cover the final question from uh, my set. And in the meantime, feel free to drop any question in the chat box. So I noticed that there are some of the students or like people within the meeting today, or like. Um, during the past few months, they are very clear about uh, how internationals, uh, how the uh, the policy will change international students' the future. So during the uncertain time, are there anything that uh, our family, friends, or people who want to show support can help international students? One of the things that. Um... First of all, I mean, I will give you concrete things that your family and friends can do. Uh, advocacy is so important. You all are living in this jurisdiction. You are allowed to call congressmen, senators, congresswomen. It's very important to have your voice heard. Um, and oftentimes immigrants feel like they can't say anything, but you still can and you want to get your voice heard. Representatives want to learn what their constituents um, want. And so you can do that, but if you have family friends who are green card holders, US citizens, they won't be afraid. So you can say, call your senator and say, advocate for student visas or whatever your, your issue is, well, you know, immigration reform in general. And so one thing is for them to call their representatives and ask for immigration reform, protect student visas, and so forth. The second thing is that, and I just don't know how this is going to play out because it's very new. Have, has, has everybody heard about public charge? Has anybody heard that term yet? Public charge is basically the government saying, and you're familiar with it without knowing the name. Uh, public charge is basically the government saying, we want to see you have enough money to pay for yourself and your schooling and you're never going to get public assistance. As, this, as international students, you are always showing your funds to actually get the visa when you get to the embassy or if you're doing like anything with USCIS, you know, with a new F1 or whatever. February 24, 2020, just before the pandemic, the government implemented this new policy. And it applies to everybody. It primarily is trying to weed out immigrants who want to get a green card. And so they have to go through a very uh, difficult process to fill out new forms to show um, I'm never going to get public assistance. And that requires showing, you know, English, you have an education. It's, it's, it's actually a, a long list of things. And if you're interested, the form is called I-944. And it is worth looking at, Google that or look at the USCIS website. Um, it's a difficult challenge, but that has gone into almost everything when you're doing a change of status. So anybody doing an H4, they will be using a form called I-539, for example, and that form will essentially say, have you ever had any benefits? Now, you might be saying no, but they also might come back and say, I want to see the money. One of the things I often say to almost all my clients in almost every context, the movie Jerry Maguire had this very famous line saying, show me the money. Really, it's like that. Depending on what kind of visa it is, you've got to show them the money. Whether you're the H-1B employer, you've got to show them the money that you can afford to pay the salary. If you're getting a green card, you've got to say, show me the money I can afford to pay for myself. That could happen. We haven't seen any practical cases yet, at least in my office, but I don't think anyone has because it went in, implemented in February and March came along and everything shut down. So I don't think anybody has got real life experience on it, but it might be that you will have to ask your friends and family to potentially show financial sponsorship. Not sure yet. And so even if they do, I don't know how that's going to be accepted. But these are some of the challenges that are coming down the pike. And so it's important that you are staying abreast of it. 